The Manx Radio Budget Special is brought to you by Crow Isle of Man. Chartered accountants. Smart decisions. Lasting value. Very good afternoon to you. Well, five years of Alfred Cannon in the Treasury have passed like a shot. And now David Ashford is Treasury Minister, taking over after two difficult years. Interestingly, though, um, Mr Cannon got to his feet to second this, the first of David Ashford's budget. How will this affect you, our listeners? Uh, well, the, the, the tagline of this particular budget is investing in our island's future. The message the government perhaps want to get across is, uh, hey guys, we've got a handle on this. Um, something that he said quite early on in his speech, Mr Ashford, it's crucial we give ourselves time to breathe. Well, has this uh, budget given the island time to breathe? Let's just have a look at a couple of things that he said during the budget, which I think are quite significant. Uh, I quote here, whilst the finances are still robust, the public purse cannot withstand continuing funding for support schemes, as has been, and I want to send a clear message that except in the event of emergencies, businesses now need to plan to operate without further support. Interesting, a lot of businesses will be sitting up and taking note of that. Also, as far as health and social care is concerned, obviously in the last few years, they have come for more and more cash. Is that going to go on? Well, he says in his speech, it's important that the department and Manx Care recognise that there is and must be a financial constraint on the level of services they can provide. This is fundamental as an aspect of budgeting and financial control. The challenge for the department next year will be to make plans to prioritise services within the financial envelope available. Will they be able to achieve that? And one last point. Uh, inflation is now 6% or more. Well, the government have given themselves for pay costs 2%. Uh, and there is an appeal from the Treasury Minister I fully expect there to be pressure on pay budgets. I would like to stress the need for such awards to be equitable across all stakeholders. The island's finances are currently tighter than we've seen for a long time. Our economy is strong but has suffered in line with the rest of the world as a result of the pandemic. I would encourage any pay claims brought forward to recognise these facts and for all parties to bear this in mind. During any negotiations, we'll be hearing from representatives of the unions later on, but how does it affect the person in the street, the Joe and Joanna and everyone else in the street? Uh, Beth has joined me. She is dressed for summer. I am dressed for winter. So we can bring out both sides of the budget. But Beth, you have That's the details. That's what we're going to do. It was interesting listening to the Treasury Minister, David Ashford, this morning, a speech that lasted around about sort of 50 minutes or so. He did say it's not time to react with knee-jerk changes. There was a warning, though, for government departments saying that next year's budget for them would be really challenging. But John, you mentioned how the budget is going to affect the average person. So we heard things like key rises in the following benefits, basic state pension going up 3.1%, child benefit for those who are eligible 5%, carer's allowance, that was an interesting one, up 15%. And I think a recognition perhaps of the true value that people who are in caring positions really... I think uh, the standard's about £122 at the moment, so that will go up to closer to 140 I think. It certainly will. Uh, we have a panel with us for this first hour. Let's meet them now and gauge some of their reactions to the early indications of the budget. Uh, Nicola Bowker, Managing Director of Nicola Bowker & Co. You were listening this morning. What was your initial reaction? Well, um, it, it's certainly not a radical budget. I don't think anybody could accuse it of that. Stability, I think, is probably the, the message I got out of it. Though I feel a bit like, uh, I don't want to say mirroring the UK, but there are some, <clears throat> on the face of it, uh, increases in there, but the rate of inflation behind those increases and some lack of changes in some things are going to be felt by people, um, I think, as the year progresses, as the value of money is diminished. So you think maybe too cautious, perhaps? <clears throat> I think um, I think possibly yes. I think it could have been more radical. It's really difficult because the government has been pumping money into the economy for two years now, and uh, businesses are kind of at their knees. People are tired, and uh, I think there's another year where we've just got to take stock and take it steady, but there's certainly nothing in there to... To, to light the fire to the uh, you know round uh, round the campfire there it's just you know we've just got to sit tight work hard but I think I think we will notice that the inf when if inflation does what it looks like it's going to do this budget may be 
a bit light on its offering. Was there anything in there in particular that you thought, I'd like to see this and it didn't appear? Something that you think could light that fire? Well, um, I, I, there, was no, there was no radical changes to, to maybe how uh, businesses can continue to be supported. Um, rates are a big challenge. There has been support on rates, uh, for, with rates, uh, over the pandemic. Businesses have spent all of their available money. They have nothing left. Uh, those brave individuals who've started businesses during the pandemic need to build up stuff. So, so to take away all of the support for business now um, and not give any uh, additional uh, allowance on their personal side means that the entrepreneurs really are, it feels to me like the recovery is on the shoulder of the entrepreneurs here. OK, Nicola, for the moment, thank you. We're also joined by John Webster, who's an economist and chairman of the Manx Technology Group. Uh, John, your initial thoughts to what you've been hearing this morning? I'd, I'd agree with Nicola. Um, the, the main problem um, is that government doesn't recognise or doesn't appear to recognise the underlying problems of the Isle of Man economy. I've been an observer for a, a long time, uh, and this is probably the worst financial position I have seen the Isle of Man in. Uh, and the reason is we have an ongoing structural deficit and we have no clear economic strategy. We've outsourced the economic strategy for some reason um, when uh, we should really have been doing that ourselves. The people working in government should understand what the economy is about and should, without going to an outside source, uh, identify what's necessary because they will be the people who are implementing it. The history of the last few years has been that government has had wonderful rhetoric, but very poor delivery. And we just have to look, for example, at the public sector itself. It's grown rapidly in terms of numbers, in terms of pay. The average public sector worker now has 10,000 a year, more than the average white collar worker and much more than the manual, color work, uh, the manual worker. We have an obvious cultural problem, as shown in the tribunal last week with Dr. Ranson. And um, I, I think we have a performance prob problem, as manifest in the prom, the flume uh, issue, and various other things. So this, gov this budget didn't look at any of the fundamental issues facing the, the government. In my view, I think, uh, the, the economic strategy. There is going to be a look at that in in the summer, isn't it? Uh, there's going to be a look at a whole lot of things: social security and, and, and tourism. But I think economic strategy is another one they've flagged up to say we will be looking at that. But it's a long way between looking at it and implementing it, isn't it? Well, meanwhile, what do businessmen do on the island? We, we, we know that the uh, the fiscal position is going to be changed because the OECD is looking at. Um, uh, the minimum ra rate of corporation tax. I know there may be ways ar around that, but the, the beneficial owner issue is going to be a, a, another hit on the island, I would imagine. Uh, and yet we are still waiting for some indication from government as to what the new strategy will be. John Webster, I'd be really interested to hear some of your ideas of how you would tackle some of those issues in a moment, but let's meet the rest of our panel. Uh, John Curtis is the director of the management company Curtis and Associates. John, what were your thoughts this morning? Yes, uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, thank you for inviting me to the panel. So I have a particular interest in, uh, in climate change uh, mitigation. As you all know, the Isle of Man joined the Paris Agreement uh, late last year at COP26. I was at COP26, I believe I was the only Isle of Man based businessman there, uh, together with the climate transformation team who announced the fact that the Isle of Man was joining the, uh, the Paris Agreement. <clears throat> so to add to what John Webster said, I think that uh, one, must be, one must predict some, some tightening um, uh, in the future. In the year 2019-2020, a total of 300,000 about was spent by the Isle of Man government on climate change adaptation and mitigation. That increased to 1 million the following year. And in the year 21-22, a budget was put forward of 19 million. So we've just heard the Treasury Minister announce a new fund of 25 million. That increases the total for this year, as he said, to 42 million. This is a lot of money. 
And we have to prepare in the future for radical changes in the way that we live our lives and what it's going to cost us to live those lives. So, for example, most notably for me, the Treasury Minister mentioned that the 25 million new climate change revenue fund would not be met solely from the public purse, it would need to be met from private sources as well. This means that businesses are going to have to pay for the cost of climate change. We as individuals and citizens are going to have to pay for this change and these changes are going to have to start very soon. To meet the interim target, there is still a consultation ongoing by the government for the interim target, um, which year it's going to be, but there are going to be radical changes in the way that we live. And, I, and what this amounts to basically are carbon taxes. You can call them by lots of other ways, but it is a carbon tax. That tax will be on businesses who, who need to seek to reduce their carbon footprints um, by, by the interim target and then to net zero by the year 2050. And it'll be, met, it'll be met by point of sale taxes. For example, when you get on the boat to go to the mainland, probably you'll have to pay an extra five or 10 pounds. Who knows exactly what that figure will be. But then there is also the, the problem with, uh, with people who can't afford heat pumps, who can't afford solar panels, etc. And that cost will have to be met by something called social offsetting. This is where uh, wealthier individuals or higher tax rate payers will have to contribute in some way or the other to the people who can't afford £10,000 to put in a new heat pump. So that's my perspective. I'm very pleased to see that the government has increased and is increasing and is taking very seriously the problem of climate change because when I was at COP26, I was also called by Manx Radio um, and I was called and they said, well, what do you think? And I said, well, the government isn't doing enough. I'm very pleased to say that I now think they are moving ahead and very positively making changes. As someone who was at COP26, what do you think it achieved? Well, in simple terms, for the man in the street, if they seem to get an awful lot of people there and they spent an awful lot of money, what came out of it? Well, of course, I was there as a, as a businessman and I know that uh, we, as a businessman, I have to adapt my business to climate change. I have to be, do my part. But it was a bit disjointed. Uh, the business community was in a totally separate part of uh, Glasgow. It wasn't connected to the main conference and therefore we weren't party to a lot of the discussions that were going on. I think it was probably not successful from the point of view of the individual citizen because the, the clarity isn't there and I have to say I don't see the clarity there either at the moment in the way information is being delivered to citizens on the island. I'd like to see much more clarity in what these objectives are. John Curtis for the moment, thank you very much. Uh, let's meet Pippa Lovell now, who's a sustainable chef and a small business owner. And Pippa, just from your point of view, how much attention would you normally give the budget process in general? Is it something that really crosses your radar, would you say? If I'm totally honest, this whole, like this is just far too much information for me to digest. Like I get quite emotional and overwhelmed by stuff. And this for me, even just listening to you guys and your opinions, I am so overwhelmed. And that's a problem, isn't it? And I think that's like literally for, look. But for people, <laughs> generally, <coughs> Paul Chase, let me bring you in here because uh, Paul Chase is the director of financial options. And is this me. not the main issue that we have with the budget process? People don't understand it. It's all words. What does it mean? Yeah, it, it is an awful lot of words. I mean, I, I you asked me before if I'd caught the budget before I uh, joined the, the session, and I was watching it on Max Radio on the uh, on, on the on the live blog um, with the headlines, and then when we're presented with the actual speech, uh, it goes into a great deal more detail. Uh, it does take people talking about it to break it down into the, the sort of pounds and pence effectively. Um, the headlines that you guys start off the programme with, the state pension um, being uh, increased by 3.1% behind inflation at 8%, all of these sort of things are, are the headlines which um, I think are the bits that are actually going to translate down into real people's lives. I actually just should say that anyone listening, there are no major tax changes in this budget, so that the benefits are going up by various amounts. Three point, where does that 3.1 come from? Is that reflecting... UK, because obviously I inflation in the, is, in the speech yeah. it is the UK. Um, it's reflecting the, the UK consumer yeah. index. Yeah. So various things for pensioners, basic state pension, child benefit, carers allowance, they're all going up by um, well, fifteen percent for carers allowance, but the rest by three point one percent. So uh, there are little bits and pieces going up, but I suppose people should be asking themselves, okay, we're getting a little bit there, but what is in this budget document, this giant budget document, that is taking it away from me? So at the end of the day, am I going to end up a loser? 
Lots of questions to be answered. You are listening to the Budget Special brought to you by Crow Isle of Man. It's just gone 12.21. We'll take a short break and be back after this. The Manx Radio Budget Special is brought to you by Crow Isle of Man. Chartered accountants. Visit crow.im or call 627 and this is the budget special. Just gone 12.23. It's John Moss and Beth Hesby joined by John Webster, economist and chairman of the Manx Technology Group. John Curtis, director of the management company Curtis & Associates. Nicola Bowker, managing director at Nicola Bowker & Co. Uh, Paul Chase, who's director of financial options. And Pippa Lavelle, who's a sustainable chef and small business owner. We're joined uh, in the Millennium Room in the Legislative Buildings by a small audience. We'll be having some questions for them uh, during this budget special. But it was really interesting. Uh, Pippa was talking about being being overwhelmed by this whole process and we've actually got our Manx Radio Budget mini site which is intending to try and break it down a little bit because John Moss, have so many Johns we're getting confused. Uh, that, excellent name, excellent name. <laughs> that is the main issue I think that well, we've seen well, year on year isn't it? Interestingly he did say later on in his speech I believe this is Mr Ashford speaking not myself um, I believe now is the time for a review of the budget process we will review and consider how he can design a system which ensures that responsibility for spending decisions is tied more closely to the accountability of the cost and outcome of the decisions he could also add I suppose and we can make it more understandable uh, for the 85,000 plus well I suppose Bands and babies won't be reading this, uh, but but the other people who pick up a document and look at it, and basically it's like looking at that machine uh, at Bletchley Park. You look at it and you think, well, it's all very spectacular this budget document, but how how on earth does it work? What comes out of it, etc.? So simplicity, I suppose. John Webster, I'm just going to ask you this because with your former hat on uh, a number of years ago now as uh, economic advisor to the Isle of Man government, is there a deliberate tactic of hiding stuff in the budget so people won't really see? The nitty gritty, or is that just being a bit cynical? Um, I, I like cynicism. Um, <laughs> it's how like can buying, I uh, buying the wife some flowers? Yeah, yeah. Why is she buying me flowers? What's she hiding? Well, as a Bank of England governor once said, if you understand what I'm saying, uh, you're misunderstanding me. And the idea is that uh, you can sometimes hide grim reality with with uh, rhetoric. And uh, I hope it's the case that government is uh, protecting its citizens from the reality rather than not understanding the severity of the problem. I've, I've just jotted down a list of 10 issues which I think are very important from the Alabama point of view. One is uh, the demographic situation. Um, throughout the world, there is a problem with uh, uh, aging population and it's uh, obvious in the Isle of Man we now have 22 percent of the population over the age of retirement and the, the, the set, although we were led to believe that there was a, an increase in population the latest census figures uh, indicate that there in fact weren't the de facto population was about 82,000 and of the census population a number something like six or seven thousand uh, use the island only for second homes. Uh, the, in other words, they're not permanent resident here. Um, in addition to that, we have um, a, a school uh, population which has declined. Sorry, go on. No, I was just going to bring in a question there from the NASUWT, the Teachers Union, and I think that this ties in with that. Without financial investment in education increasing to tackle our recruitment and retention, how will we deliver our first class system of education and retain our dedicated professionals? So a suggestion that in this budget there isn't much that focuses on that. And it's interesting, isn't it? We, we keep on pushing ourselves as a world class destination, trying to get people to come over here. But really, have we got the education? Have we got the health care to back that up? They're very two, two very good points. Um, one of the things that's quite obvious in the UK and the Isle of Man is the low level of productivity. And the other thing that's obvious is that AI and robotics is going to greatly affect the employment of, of people who have no skills. Uh, and I did a quick back of the envelope comp, um, calculation a couple of years ago, discussed it with the then economic advisor, and it indicated that about 8,000 jobs on the Isle of Man were at risk. Now, I would like to see the government saying, OK, these jobs are at risk. Uh, what are we going to do about retraining and training? 
Uh, and in terms of education and medicine, why don't we look at distant learning and telemedicine? Distant learning could be both an export, because we could focus on a particular area and deliver those services throughout the world. And we could acquire um, services where we lack the skills on Ireland by encouraging our students to, to do di distance learning. The same applies to telemedicine. Pippa, can I bring you in here? What was it that encouraged you to relocate to the Isle of Man? My partner's job, really. Quite a niche role within, in, within um, the healthcare system. So we came for that uh, and the fact it's a biosphere, which for me personally, I think... <laughs> I say I'm overwhelmed by the budget, <clears throat> but it's because I've too many opinions, probably, about it. But I came here for a different job, essentially, which didn't work out, hence opening my own businesses, blah, blah, blah. But the fact it's a biosphere was the main thing, and from my perspective, I feel like that... There's, like, one biosphere officer. How, how come that's not funded a bit more, considering we're looking at spending so much money on marketing the island... But then it's like, where's the substance to that? And and for me, the fact it's a biosphere, we use it such a great big marketing tool, but then actually help them. And There are instances, I mean, tourism is one case where we do a lot of marketing and we say, look what we got. And you think, well, hang about, what have we got? We've yes. got footpaths that basically people complain about. We've got other things that we complain about. I think We're you saying... can use the marketing and almost like purposeful, greenwashing can almost be purposeful sometimes. Like we can use it as it can be a good thing. But then like I have the food foundation from England coming over for a forage and a meal and stuff next week. And there's so much I want to talk about. But then it's easy to do over the internet and to do through email and through show and marketing and everything. But then actually when they're here, I'm thinking, oh, God, I've actually got to back this up. And I'm like, how? <laughs> I mean, I will. But, yeah, so I came here for, obviously, opportunities and, and knowing that I didn't always want to work for someone else and I could open businesses and I found it quite easily and it's been a really supportive environment. But, like, I've done all that now, tick, 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 and now I'm looking for sub substance. And, and the budget for me, as much as I'm totally overwhelmed and, and you know, I, I know loads and nothing at the same time, I'm just really looking forward to the department's breaking down what their budget's going to be spent on. I think that's more important than what goes where. The breaking down for me is more important. Paul Chase? Um, just to just to cover up, it, it, it struck me as you were asking about Pippa when she moved to the, why she moved to the island. Um, and then John uh, Webster was talking about having to try and attract people uh, to the island. And that's that's one of the biggest um, uh, parts of the sort of government's plan going forward. Um, but where are they actually going to live? Because that is a massive problem in terms of housing. And I was uh, I saw that there's £2 million pounds being given to the Housing Communities Board, um, but it seems to be a very slow process. Uh, I know they've brought forward the consultation on the first time buyer scheme, um, which was supposed to happen later in the year. I submitted my response yesterday. Um, and uh, I, I believe that the housing situation is a bit of a crisis. So if we are looking to attract people to the island, um, there's just simply nowhere for them to live and nowhere for them to afford to buy. Pippa? Just, just to put that literally in relation to my business, I've relocated like a Greek chef over to the Isle of Man to work here. Obviously, we need to have a totally different opinion about workforce and skill shortage, blah, blah, blah. That's a separate issue. But she's currently living with me and my, and my partner in my house. And as much as I love her and she's my friend, I don't want her to live with me. I want to find her somewhere to rent or buy or like I want to keep her here. But the reality is, is... You know, we might want to have kids and we want our space back and stuff, but then what do I do with her? Can't put her anywhere, so mm -hmm. I'm going to have to send her away. That's really There's interesting. There's no to live, literally, and I want to keep the amazing chef, but I can't. In the island plan, they've dropped the phrase affordable housing and made it into more reasonable housing. So they've gone to a... Yeah, but, but the question is, what is the cost of reason? What, what is a reasonable house? How much does it cost? And, and I've heard in some places that people hit upon a house, say that's our dream house, go to the bank, and the bank say, no, it's not worth that much. Mm. We'll give you a mortgage much lower than that. And therefore, these people can't afford to buy it. That's, that's absolutely right. And, and we are seeing uh, first-time buyers now really buying at a minimum 300000 350000 which is just unheard of a, a few years ago. And they're doing it largely with the, the, the uh, help of the bank of mum and dad um, to sort of prop up the deposits. The lenders are lending more. 
um, we're now up to six times income with uh, with three of the lenders on the island, um, but it's still unsustainable, and the the property is just no longer there, which has caused the property prices to increase. If you have to go up to six times your income, it's very dangerous. Uh, Absolutely. If your job falters or, or whatever, your health or whatever, you're stuck with it. Yeah, very much so. But people are pushing themselves to those limits just to achieve the uh, the, the dream of uh, home ownership. Um, but it is now starting to fail. You're listening to the Budget Special brought to you by Crow Isle of Man. I should say, 166177. You can text us any thoughts or questions you might have or email studio at manxradio.com. Uh, David H., I think in response to John Webster talking about the ageing population, said, I'm 71 years old. Does that make me a problem? Mm. Interesting perception there. John Curtis, you wanted to come in and uh, yeah, say something. I just wanted to come in on the, on the housing issue because I feel very strongly about this as well. Uh, you know, usually young people are leaving the island not coming here. So the rumour has it that most of the new builds in Balasala were, were purchased by people off island and the, and the coronavirus pandemic has exacerbated this problem because people are looking for safe, safe places to go, particularly if they can't travel to, to, to Europe, etc. So, you know, if you look at places like Cornwall, some, some places in Wales, you know, there are taxes on second homes. And, you know, I, I, don't, want to, I don't want myself to be, become the tax man, having talked about carbon taxes early on. But maybe there should be some consideration in the future about taxing second homes. Now, the government are obviously pouring resources. We've heard, I think, is it uh, Mr Hooper is now joining the board, the housing board, uh, Mr Crooker, uh, Mr Thomas is there already. But w what is the answer? How do you s produce homes that are a reasonable cost? How do you get the developers to do that job? Well, the, the, John's made a, a very good point there. Um, that is that there are quite a few homes, 15% of the accommodation on the Isle of Man was unoccupied. Now, 15% represents, what, six or 7,000 uh, dwellings, flats, apartments, um, houses, etc. Now, I agree with John. We should think about taxing um, people who use the Isle of Man as an accommodation address or an, as an investment because it's, um, it may be nice from a government uh, point of view to say, yes, we've got these people who are buying property and be great from the, pro the developer's point of view because the price goes up. But from the person buying, the first-time buyer point of view, we now have a situation where um, house prices are ten times the average wage for, for for a, a 20 to 25 year old. Now, we've got to resolve that, and it's not just a matter of rebuilding, it's a, ma a matter of effectively using the existing stock of accommodation. Nicola Bowker, any thoughts on housing? Um, I think there's a, there's a big crisis in, in terms of the government aspiration to attract people to the island. I get approximately 10 inquiries a week from people looking to relocate to the island um, and looking for some support in terms of how to do that. And I find myself now uh, putting the question of, it's not when you can find somewhere to live here, it's if you can find somewhere to live here. A lot of people don't want to, to buy initially, they want to rent. The rental market is, is very short in supply um, and the people off island don't don't have the contacts of the people on the island because I think people are resorting to to it's who you know not what you know type tactics so I think it's it is a big problem the housing stock and it, affordability is the issue can I just ask one quick of those 10 what percentage on rough terms do you think actually successfully come across here um I would say about uh two or three of them two or three right 30 percent yeah 20 to 30 percent yeah don't forget, a lot of people leave the island as well. If, if you look at the figures between 2016 and 2021, something like 6,800 people arrived, but 4,500 people left. Now, that, that churn is, is quite, quite interesting because I know quite a few people who came to the Isle of Man and we would wish to retain them, but they left for one reason or another. Um, and can I just quickly answer the person who said he's 71 and is he any, of any value. Well, I'm older than that, so I hope you are of some value. You just mentioned the census, incidentally. Have you got a copy of this fabled document? Uh, part one has just been released, just but been for some re reason it's taking longer than I think it should have done. 
Uh, let's just go to our audience. We've got a, a question from Adrian. Uh, just a, a thought on the budget. Adrian, what was the question? Well, I was just going to, very interested in what the panel have been saying, but very interested in what Mr Webster has been um, talking about the economy generally. And I just wonder, a question for the panel, a question for government, is it time to have a rethink of the Zero Ten strategy? John Webster, shall we come to you first? Uh, yeah, I'm happy to do that. Uh, absolutely, uh, w we, we have to look at that because we're going to be forced to, to do so by the OECD anyway. And the, the old model that we had, which was to differentiate ourselves by taxation, is no longer viable in future. And it's long gone past the time we should have been reviewing our fundamental economic strategy and deciding where this island is heading. This move to get 15 percent, and we heard Mr. Ashford say it only applies to major companies. It 750 does. million pounds uh, worth of, of, of asset or worth of production. So it's not going to affect the island a great deal, or is it? Well, you know, w w when people st first started looking at taxation, I remember having conversations about, you know, well, this bit won't affect us. But you've got to look at the direction of travel and whether something is innately acceptable or not. And using tax as a way of uh, attracting people is no longer uh, acceptable, either ethically or uh, often from a regulatory or fiscal point of view. So you really do have to examine what you're doing and make sure that we are in line with future thinking. John Curtis? Yes, I'm... Um I'm a supporter of a minimum rate of corporation tax. Um, many companies have zero rate. You know, I'm going to be branded here the tax man, I think, in this panel session. <laughs> but actually, be because uh, my business overseas is, 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 has the zero taxation rate, um, I face many problems in dealing with some countries. Uh, ten years ago, I couldn't uh, do any trading with Italy, for example, and many other, com many other countries in the EU did not trade with the Isle of Man because of the zero taxation rate. I'm actually an advocate of a minimum corporation tax rate of around 5%, which will bring in much-needed revenue for the island. Adrian, did you want to come back on that? Yeah, I'm very interested in, in what you say, um, Mr Curtis. Um, but there's absolutely no appetite that I can see in government for any changes to that, and there hasn't been for many years. And also there's a large sector, uh, a, a large number of people in the private sector um, and the financial services sector who are against any uh, corporation tax on the basis that business may leave the island and go to other havens such as the Cayman and places like that. So I think unless government can get a grip on this, and we can all help in putting that message across, it's going to be very difficult in the future. If I may just add, add to that uh, a little. I agree with John that, you know, the paradigms have changed, the world has moved on, and we need to look at the whole mechanism of taxation in a different way than it was looked at 30 years ago. I should say we will be joined after one o'clock by the Treasury Minister, other members of Timwood as well. So some of these questions we will be able to put to them in the second half of the programme. 12.41, we'll take a short break. The Manx Radio Budget Special is brought to you by Crow Isle of Man. Chartered accountants, smart decisions, lasting value. It's 12.45. Lovely to have you with us this afternoon, the first of our um, budget special hours. We're joined by a panel at the moment. Members of Timwood will be here after 1pm. Uh, a text message in to 166177. One major issue for families is the lack of help for childcare and the fact maternity benefit hasn't increased at all for the past eight years. With rents sky high and inflation going up, it's just not affordable to have children, which doesn't help the situation with regard to the ageing population. We also still don't have shared parental leave available so women are disadvantaged and it sets the wrong tone for gender equality from the get-go. I just want to go to the audience quickly here and Sam, you've got a question. Uh, yeah, so given factors like uh, the lack of available housing, the lack of funding and education, why should members of the younger demographic like myself even really consider staying on island? Good question. Who wants to answer that one? John uh, Webster? Because you love it. <laughs> uh, well... Uh, <laughs> We can't sell the island on um, people being able to go uh, and dive off rocks into the sea. And, and sentimentality. And we can't do that. The only thing that really attracts young people is good, good uh, job offers. You have to have a good job offer and you have to have 
um, reasonable further education, higher education, uh, and good entertainment, etc. So the package starts with a good job, because if you don't get a good job, you're not going to stay here. So this comes back to what I was saying earlier, Beth, and that we have to look at the fundamental economy and make sure it's attractive to young people. And I don't see any clear evidence that we're, we have any uh, new areas of activity that we're targeting. Sam, can I just ask you, are you planning to stay here? Uh, ab absolutely not. No. Um, it's, it, and this is the absolutely thing, because you, you mentioned that, um, you know, because you love it. And I, I do love it. You know, I've grown up here. It's, it's got a fantastic history. You know, this is where my friends are. Um, but at the end of the day, like, I couldn't, I couldn't justify staying here when I'd have so much more opportunity elsewhere. So I do, I completely agree with that. And I think as well, there's a kind of uh, perception, or it seems like that in some members of government or some members of the island that, you know, oh, you know, why, why aren't young people saved? We, we shouldn't put effort into making them things available for them because they'll leave anyway. When I think it's the reverse, they leave because effort isn't put in. Yeah. And I think that if you do that, you'll actually find a lot of us would, would stay. It's purely because the effort isn't put in. But historically, yeah. don't young people like to look over the horizon? I, I mean, I'm, you know, it depends on the young person, I guess. But I mean, there's, I, I know loads of people my age who, if they had the opportunity to stay, and, it, you know, they could do amazing things here. I think the island has so much potential. And it's about that untapped potential that, that, that would excite them. But it's just not available. Sam, can I ask how old you are? I'm 18. OK. Um, Paul Chase, that's a really interesting um, comment there, I think, from Sam. And I just wonder, from your point of view as a, a financial advisor, how many young people like that you deal with, or, you know, are you seeing? Uh... We, we do see quite a lot of people that come that speak to us and find out um, what they can borrow if they're looking to buy a, a property. Um, and often they, it's not enough. Um, and their comments are, you know, if I, if I want to be serious and, and buy my own home, then I'll have to have to look elsewhere. Because um, renting, as we, I think Nicola mentioned earlier, the rental market is actually uh, stretched as well. So, so yeah, no, it's, a, it's a relatively common um, story that we're hearing, that people are, are, are despairing because they can't f uh, afford a property to live in. And then we have to ask, I suppose, John Moss, is this budget dealing with that? Um, I, it doesn't appear to be. It seems to be a, a softly, softly budget at the moment, which is really looking over its shoulder the COVID two years and thinking about that and thinking how best we can smoothly come out of that rather than boldly looking towards the future. And I suppose that's really uh, we, we need to have a we need to have a running start and get involved and go uh, and reinvent to bring the island out of the COVID situation without being frightened of what's happened in the last two years. My opinion. Uh, we haven't mentioned Brexit, actually, incidentally, uh, which I, I don't suppose. <laughs> yeah. well, I mean, we, there was a, um, Alfred Cannon was speaking shudder. on agenda last yeah. night, uh, and he said we have to work out what we can control. Is, is Brexit on the uh, agenda at the moment? John Webster was it? Well, well I, I, I asked. Um, Are we handling it? I, I, I asked my own company yesterday, is it affecting us in any way? And the answer was no. Um, it's taking uh, a week to get uh, supplies from China. Uh, it's taking us a week to get supplies from Spain, which is exactly the same as it was pre-Brexit. So, and so from our point of view, and I can only speak for myself, it, it's not having an impact. Bye-bye, Brexit. Bye-bye. <laughs> well, uh, we've yeah. had another text into 16177 saying carbon taxes will now crush businesses at present. Many, many are hanging on by their fingertips. Heat pumps simply aren't practical. Just a trendy idea at the moment. Electric cars aren't sustainable. Green issues, says Bill, need real thought, not just panic trends. John Curtis, I'm going to come to you here. I'm going to play devil's advocate. Is it the right time to ring fences £42 million pounds for uh, climate change issues when there's so much else to spend on? Are we just wasting our money? The, uh, the UK government has already been sued by, uh, by a pressure group because they, they're not in line with their own self-imposed target. Uh, the UK has actually reduced um, its, uh, its carbon footprint by 42% in the last 20 years. The Isle of Man's footprint has gone up in the last three years. We have an enormous challenge. Yes, the money must be ring-fenced. It doesn't mean that it's going to be spent. In fact, there was in the budget of last year, there were allocations put aside, and, and most of that money wasn't touched. So I think it is important that this is, if you run a business, you have to look at your liabilities in the future. 
carbon and carbon taxes is a liability. It's a liability that must be met by the business community. And as the Treasury Minister said, I'm trying to repeat, he said this 42 million will not be met by the public purse uniquely. It has to be met by business as well. But I wonder, there don't seem to be many incentives in this budget at all. You know, there's no incentives for people to buy electric cars or, you know, there's no financial incentives, which is what people need to well, get a head £1. start. Well, at £1.48 a, a, a litre, there is an incentive, as a matter of fact. It costs uh, just a few pence a mile to run an electric car. The, the main issue for EVs on the island are the number of charge points, which needs to be urgently addressed, particularly in Douglas, which doesn't have the, the infrastructure to do that. And lithium-ion, of course, which the Chinese are busy buying up quite a bit of the world's supply. Um, There's no magic wand, John. But the, no. the cost of buying an electric car is, is really significant, though. People can't afford it. It's, it's a few thousand. So, please go ahead. Pippa. Did you say? Pippa? I just was saying it's an investment. Like, we, we have to do this now for, for our future. Like, just coming back to the whole young people staying here and stuff, can I just say, first off, one reason to stay... Uh, you can easily open businesses here. The micro business grant scheme is like 400 and whatever, 38 or something every year. So we can open businesses and businesses and businesses and businesses. So that's one reason to stay. And and back to the skills shortage as such and, and training and distance learning and everything. That's the perfect opportunity to cut carbon as well, distance learning. But we, from a personal perspective, like... I'm sending staff to work in other places t to learn, but then I'm footing that bill. I'd love to see some incentives, you know, not just apprentice schemes and stuff like that, but some incentives for businesses to be able to then send and, and train our young workforce and train our young people here, which would also save carbon in many ways, but that's a whole different issue. But in terms of businesses and sustainability, just if, if your business cannot be green and cannot be sustainable like i personally feel there is no place for your business anymore like it's every every single kind of industry on the isle of man is like saturated right now look how many restaurants there are how many there's just everything of everything it's so saturated and maybe covid and 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 climate change and everything is a way of just trickling it down to the ones that maybe might just be making change and being good moving forward. And if you're going to moan about having to foot the bill for for, for doing that and, and making yourself greener, then it's, it's ridiculous. You're not thinking about your children and the future generations. You're literally just finding a reason to moan. You're not going to take responsibility for, for our whole island as a whole. And of course people don't want to stay here if we're not going to take responsibility for it. Sorry, I'm getting quite angry. That's okay. It's okay. <laughs> uh, Paul but, Chase, yeah. you to come in. I, I was just going to sort of support Pippa and, and you look at the world of investing at the moment and everywhere you turn there's ESG funds, uh, environmental, social and governance funds. It's, it's, it's the way of the future basically people are now investing in new technologies greener technologies they're investing in companies which are not investing in um, uh, uh, slave labor um, and they're making uh, sensible choices in terms of investing in companies that are actually actively making a, a difference to the world um, and um, the, the performances on those products are actually reflecting it so I think it is the way of the future so I would support the, uh, the, the government's um, dedication to that um, I would just question the priorities on if there's nobody here to benefit from it. Nicola, any thoughts? Well, yes, um, I represent a lot of small businesses um, and I am not seeing any guidance for the small businesses to assess their carbon footprint. Um, is there a scheme out there? If there is, I'm not aware of it. Um, <clears throat> I don't know the carbon footprint of my business. It's something fairly low on my agenda, but it's on my agenda and it needs to get higher on my agenda, but there's no mechanism made easy for me to assess the carbon footprint of my business so I can determine where the problems are and how I can, can improve it easily. So um, that would be a great benefit for all of those small businesses we have on the island. There's many, many thousands of them. Well, we're approaching the end of this first hour, John, um, but I'm just going to go around and in sort of 10, 20 seconds, if I can just get you all just to give us your overall assessment, starting with you, Paul, of this budget, looking at it as a whole, what do you say in 10 seconds? Uh, as a whole, um, it's a budget of stability. There's a few bits in there which are interesting, um, but uh, we are leaving people behind in terms of the uh, state pension. Pippa, any thoughts? I 
like I say, on a whole, find it hard to comprehend. I'm looking forward to each part being broken down. I feel like the way the phrase mental health hasn't been acknowledged at all, which is diabolical, and there's too many locums, anyways. But in general, I think it's not quite radical enough, especially when we've just had a clean slate, as COVID, it could have given us a clean slate, it could be a bit more radical. John Curtis, in 10 seconds. The, the allocation of 25 million with this new reserve fund is a sign of good intent because there is a legal obligation to meet the Paris Agreement now. And John Webster? Well, I'm an optimist also. I think the island's got lots of potential, but we really need to understand the problems and start working out how we're going to um, develop that potential. And Nicola? It was a stable budget for sure, but I think uh, business and individuals need more guidance as to how to move forward from this. OK, well, thank you so much to our panel for this hour. Um, hopefully some of them will be able to stay with us in the audience and may have questions during the second hour when we will be joined by members of Timwald, including the, t uh, the Treasury Minister, David Ashford, and Chief Minister, Alfred Cannon. And the if you'd like Minister as well, what did I, I say? Oh, yes, yeah, absolutely. Um, if you want to have a look at the budget in detail, head over to Manx Radio's budget mini site. You can find a link at manxradio.com and we will be back shortly. The Manx Radio Budget Special is brought to you by Crow Isle of Man. Chartered accountants. Smart decisions. Lasting value. And it's coming up to eight minutes past one. Lovely to have you with us this afternoon. It's the second hour of our Budget Special brought to you by Crow Isle of Man. We have our audience. Can you say hello? Oh, no, they're off. <laughs> Flipping neck. Need to warm them up a little bit. Uh, this hour, we're going to be joined by members of Timwald. And, uh, John, we're going to be looking in more detail at some of the things we've heard about this morning. Well, one big subject, and the health minister is with me, actually, sitting next to me, is health. Uh, and in his uh, speech, Mr Ashford actually laid down some ground rules. Uh, including phrases like the challenge for the department next year will be to make plans to prioritise services within the financial envelope available. So basically, you've got your cash, that's all you can spend. Oh, Mr Hooper, thank you for joining us, by the way. Yeah. Laurie Hooper's joined us from the debate. Uh, is that it? Are you conscious of these restrictions? Yeah, so actually, I think if you look at what's being talked about in the budget, is this uh, longer-term financial planning. So for a long time, I mean, I've been saying it for years, health is underfunded. I think I, I threw out a figure of around £7 or £8 million pounds back in 2017, 2018. That's pretty much where we're at. So we've known for a long time we haven't had enough money. And on top of that, the service as well isn't as efficient as it can be. So the, the aim of this uh, new financial settlement really is to try and say, well, let's get the right amount of money in place and drive those efficiencies at the same time. And so when David was talking about uh, that's your money, stick to it. He's got a point, actually. You know, we know that health service could, you could just keep funding everything. It could keep running out of control. And I think one of the key reasons for having the new structure is to say, well, that is unacceptable. It can't run out of control. We have to bring it back into balance because every million that you spend in health is a million that you can't spend on education or on the roads or on something else. And so you've got to make sure that all the money that you're spending is giving you proper value. Uh, for, for every single pound, and that's really the challenge that's going you, to be ahead of us. You have said that f your aim is to get from referral to treatment in 18 weeks. Is that, is that the end of the administration, not the end of this year, or uh, perhaps next end. week? He definitely said, not the end of the year. Um, no, the end of the administration is kind of my, my target. I, I'm not sure if that's achievable, but I, I'm a quite a strong believer in pushing as hard as you can to get what you need, and I think we all know that waiting times on the island are unacceptably long, and they have been for a long time. That's It's not really the, the co just COVID that's driven that. It's a lot of other pressures as well. And I think it's, it's not unreasonable to say, well, hold on a second, the 18-week target is what they have in the UK. Why shouldn't we be expecting a similar level of treatment? And how can we help Manx Care get from where we are, from the service they've inherited, to that much better position? It is going to take time. I'm not going to make any bones about that. It will take years to get there, uh, but we will get there. Perhaps you shouldn't make any bones about it as health minister. Perhaps it's not the right place to use. But um, <laughs> it's going to take cash as well, because yeah. you've inferred that some of this might involve taking people across to get their treatment. That's going to cost a lot, isn't it? Uh, yes, but will it cost more or less than our current approach is the question. And that's the question we don't have the answer to, which is in part why we need the additional funding. It's in part why we have the cost improvement plan, which actually is money that if we can save it in one part of the service, we can reinvest it in another part. So it is all part of that much bigger picture of saying, well, I think David talked about in his speech the potential of £40 million pound funding gap. Uh, and actually, we can't allow that to happen. We have to make sure it's properly resourced. And equally, we have to make sure then that we're delivering proper value for every single pound that we spend. You've got a considerable job on your hands to keep within your spending. It, it is going to be a challenge, I think, for everybody, for Max Care, for the health service more broadly, but it, I think it is a challenge that is achievable. I really do. And one man who knows about health more than most, I suppose, is David Ashford, the Treasury Minister, who's with us. You're giving him quite a tough task. 
Um, I, it, health and social care, I can say from experience, is always a tough task. Um, but I believe that Manx Care and the department are up for the challenge. I believe that they can actually do it. This budget is the first one that has identified the funding gap mm -hmm. and actually put that into cost, actually, what it's likely to be in future years. And that has a major difference in the fact that we know what we're likely facing down the line and we can actually plan accordingly. Um, Mr Ashford, we had a panel join us for the first hour and one of the things we talked about was how easy the budget process was to understand. And I understand that uh, Joni Farragher, the East Douglas MHK, stood up and said that some of it essentially was impenetrable. It, there's things hidden everywhere. It's not transparent enough. What's your reaction to that? Well, uh, members have had an opportunity to see the budget for two and a half weeks. They've had an opportunity to come forward and speak to Treasury officers or including or fellow politicians as well. Um, I myself, as Treasury Minister, have only had one member actually come to me with queries or questions. And I believe the Treasury officers have had two. Um, so there is the opportunity for members if they are struggling and it is a struggle your very first budget um, I came in with local authority experience and I'd also spent many years up in the public gallery watching a budget um, and it is a challenge being that side of the table but Treasury is there to help and assist with members if they have any queries and one of the things you have said is in your view this wasn't the time for any knee-jerk reactions I suppose I have to ask then when is the time you're not just putting off the inevitable no, um, I actually think that what we've actually done with this budget is we've allowed continued to invest in our island's future, which is the tagline for the budget, at a time when that could have been very easy to have just a standstill budget. We're coming out of the pandemic period. We are quite lucky as a nation in the fact that we've fared a lot better than many of our compatriots around the world. Um, we came out of the first lockdown very, very quickly, which allowed the internal economy to operate um, much more unrestricted than other countries. And that has actually given us much more economic resilience um, than many of our compatriots. There are some challenges, though, not least inflation, things like energy prices, things that we don't have any control over. How much contingency is there within your budget to protect people from the impact of things like that? So in terms of inflation, there are contingencies within Treasury that can be looked at if necessary. Like what? Inflation, well, there's contingency funding, for instance. And if there's absolutely special, um, um, special occurrences that take place, we can actually look to divert funding from elsewhere if necessary. Where would you take it from? To try and do it. So there's various, th various pots and funds within the reserves that could be used if necessary. But one of the key things with inflation is we don't know yet where it's likely to go. Um, I'm not going to betting man, and I certainly don't want to argue with economists, but there is two sets of economists on this. The first actually think that it's a slight inflationary spike and that after a few months we'll actually see it dissipate, a bit like they saw after the Spanish flu pandemic in 1920-1921. But then there's another set of economists that actually say this is a reset, so we're going back to where inflation generally should be because we've actually seen 30 years of quite low inflation if you look at it historically. Surely it's wiser to urge or err on the cautious side and say this could be bad let's make provision and, that is, and, and that then is, if we don't then we've got some more. And that is one of the reasons why within, within the budget um, you will actually find various funds and various contingencies in place in case we need to access them. You made a little appeal to uh, well I presume I don't know the unions but I fully expect to be pressure on pay budgets I'd like to stress the need for such awards to be equitable. You basically are asking the unions, please be reasonable. Now, unions in the past, when they want to support their members, do tend to be a little unreasonable in terms of government view, don't they? Well, you, they're you, going to try and get as much as they can, basically. Well, the unions have a job to do. Um, they are there to represent their members and they are there to get the best deal for their members. But having dealt with um, the unions in the past, I sat when I was a local authority member on Whitley Council, if anyone remembers that, for several years. Um, I do also know that... They, that you know, both sides are very considerate of the challenges that are faced and are also very realistic. Well, let's get that union view now. We are joined by Debbie Hulzell and also Geraldine O'Neill. Um, any thoughts from either of you about the, the budget? Geraldine, let's come to you first. Sorry. Uh, the major issues for us really are uh, how we retain and recruit teachers and professionals to the Isle of Man. And obviously it's going to be affordability, David, and it is a huge problem. And, you know, talking from the perspective of the unions, well, the unions represent the workers who provide the workforce, who provide the people who are going to take up jobs and young people's education and the workforce for the future. So it isn't, and it shouldn't be, an us and them situation. It should really be that we're working together for that. Uh, frankly, I'm a bit disappointed from an education point of view that we haven't seen that. 
we have a major crisis at the moment with recruitment and retention. And as um, Beth said earlier, uh, health and education, they're the two factors that attract people to the island. So if we can't provide that workforce and we can't provide sustainability for people to live here, how are we going to do, provide the education service that we all want? That's my question. Yeah, so I know the Department of Education, Sport and Culture is very keen to work with the unions, um, particularly around the issues that have been being seen around staffing, to try and find a resolution to that. There is a pay uplift in, in the budget. Now, obviously, we don't know which way, as I've just said, inflation is going to go. Um, education, along with health and also home affairs, are the, and are the departments that are very heavy in terms of staff. And if we start seeing inter-year problems, then we will have to address that. Um, I, I, we've, I've got experience of working with the unions, as you know. When I was member for the Cabinet Office, I led on the pensions negotiations. And I think it is important that we don't just engage with the unions, but we keep the unions informed as well, so they actually know what the wider challenges are too. Could, could I just answer to that? As part of that, and during COVID, we had the re-emergence of the Industrial Relations Forum, which Debbie is uh, the co-chair of that, and that's really important for all of us together to work, you know, to look at these issues and problems. Am I hearing from you, though, because we have heard this, that if you went and made a, a case, a business case, where we have a gap in funding, that that would be listened to positively by Treasury? Well, what I've got to say is the departments need to operate within their financial envelopes. They have to try. Now, like I say, we don't know what future pressures are there down the corner, and it would be for the departments to try and manage within their financial envelope. If there are external pressures that can be clearly shown as to why that can't happen, then we would have to have those conversations with that department. Debbie Halsell. Hi, I've just been thinking, obviously I took a few notes, but as far as I'm concerned, I think we're heading for a perfect storm. You actually, the budget doesn't reflect the low paid worker. And I have sat with you, David, in um, Whitley Council as I was the chair and as I was the secretary. And the low paid worker, we're still talking about zero hour contracts, we're still talking about spiralling costs of utilities, the housing, food, etc. There's a reliance, a total reliance on food banks, housing matters and poverty. There's no big investments on mental health and the well-being and the clear, way of, and clear pathways of support. So when we talk about different things, about the workers and what we do, and there was comments made about productivity earlier on, our members are actually tired. They're very, very tired. And what we would like to have seen was the personal allowance maybe upped a little bit more um, and reflective on that. Age demographic of our workforce is well over the age of 50. There doesn't seem to be any provision for them. We can't talk about retirement because that's an age discrimination thing. And I just seem to think that we needed to do a little bit more. And it didn't seem to come this time. So in relation, first of all, to the personal allowance, um, it's £250 this year. It would have been very, very easy to have actually frozen the personal allowance, to be honest, with all the other challenges that have been faced. But as Treasury Minister, I was determined that we were going to keep operating the personal allowance. We're ahead of almost all of our comparator jurisdictions in terms of personal allowance now that's available to people. In terms of benefits as well, for those who are in the very, very low pay category, um, a lot of the benefits will have seen a 5% uplift this year, including income support. Um, and we have also been doing work, and the work is ongoing, around zero hours contracts. Um, you'll remember, Debbie, I actually chaired the committee um, on zero hours con uh, contracts, and there were recommendations that came out of that committee, and work on that rec those recommendations is ongoing. And no disrespect, I absolutely get what you're saying, but all I hear is just talk. It's, it's very well to give that, that conversation, to have that conversation, but what actions fall from that is very, very slow in the uptake. And that's the frustrating part. And you talk about the uplift in the benefit, but why, is working why are working people claiming benefits when they haven't got a sustainable income? And, of course, one of the things that we are looking at and which will be debated later in Timwood is the minimum wage. Um, which is actually seeing, a, a bit of, after a pause during the pandemic, a much higher uplift than has been seen in previous years. Thank you very much, everybody, for that. Um, we've just been joined by Tim Glover, MHK, and also Rob Collister, MHK. Um, Tim, your overall thoughts on the budget in a nutshell? I am more encouraged by it than I thought it was going to be. I said that in my speech. I thought we were going to see a completely standstill budget because... 
let's be honest, a lot of the last administration has an effect on this budget. It's uh, the fingerprints of the new Treasury Minister we'll see on next year's uh, budget. Uh, a lot of it was already pretty much set in stone, I would say. Would you agree, Minister? Um, there's certain things that yeah. obviously were very you well You didn't advanced, have a lot of wriggle room, did um, you? But we've managed to do some wiggle room. Rob Collister, um, you were broadly supportive, I think, but you had one or two issues that you raised during your contribution. Yeah, one of the main concerns was the, um, the increase of 3.1% for the Manx State Pension. I felt that was too low, especially when government uses um, a September uh, inflation figure, and that was 5%, so I couldn't quite work out that one. Obviously, given everything the island's gone through over the last couple of years, I think it's an excellent budget in, in a lot of places. We're in a lot stronger position, especially with employment level, with opportunities on the island but there is the gap you know about the inflationary pressures coming through and I think that's going to be um, the risk of the next 12 months of how we actually try to control costs and that's going to be one of the biggest challenges for the, this administration over the next 12 months. That's 12 months but uh, what about the next few months? The TT, dare I mention that, the island has got to have a successful TT to say to the world we're back in business, hasn't it? Absolutely. Uh, uh, is it, are we certain, first of all we'll hear the word committed to the TT, are we certain we, the, the, the festival will go ahead? Um, yes. at, this, uh, at this range? Yes, everything is in place, ready to go. I have personally, as an MHK, I, as a backbench MHK, I've challenged to make sure our borders um, strategy is clear and precise to our visitors. The island will be ready. The TT Motorsport team have worked tirelessly over the last two years to bring back a bigger and better TT experience. Some of the changes we can't implement until 2023, but I'm hoping over the next two um, big flagship events, people will see an enhanced experience. You should and I'm going to get a lot of people coming in from all parts agreed. of the world. And there is still questions to be asked. And we were, as, as a sport and as a tourist attraction, we will follow central government guidelines with regard to so any. Is there the possibility, if something disastrous happens, as far as a, a a new variant breaks out somewhere. Yes, but you're talking all hypotheticals. Uh, at this moment in time, as I talk to you today, we are ready to go. We hope that the public will get behind us. We hope that homestay and people will come forward and offer their homes as they've always done in previous years. We've got an army of volunteers ready to go. The event is definitely a green light, and we hope on in May that we'll see the first bike go down Bray Hill as fast as, as soon as possible. Uh, now, we've just been joined by Douglas East MHK, Joni Farragher. Joni, thank you very much for being here. Um, you, during your contribution, attacked the process of the budget, um, claiming politicians hadn't had enough time to review the 183-page document, um, and just the way it's presented overall, suggestion that things are sort of hidden somewhere where you can't find them. Is that really your view? Um, so I did, uh, I had two concerns really, one was about the content of the budget and the other was about the budget process itself. Um, so the budget process, which is what you are talking about, I think, um, as I said, it, 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 it didn't feel to me like it was inclusive of all members. So obviously in September uh, last year, 24 members were elected to the House of Keys. Um, I don't see any reason that only three of those members should have input into how public funds are allocated. To me, it seems like that should be an inclusive process. And um, as I also mentioned, the couple of weeks that we were given to read the budget didn't feel like enough considering that we weren't offered any guidance that was neutral. Um, obviously, we were, we were offered guidance by Treasury themselves, um, but they, as people who wrote the, who wrote the document, will obviously have an agenda. We, we needed some neutral guidance around how to read that budget and how to extrapolate information um, in, uh, th that we needed to get out of it. A number of points there, Treasury Minister. Um, first of all, that suggestion that maybe Timor members don't have chance to have a say in the budget, only a few selected people. Well, the first thing we've got to remember is that the budget process starts around about July, August time. So it started long before the election in September. So department bids, for instance, the bids that have come forward for health and social care started off when I was Minister for Health and Social Care um, under my watch. So it is a process time. So members will have much more involvement, particularly new members come next year. Um, members are involved, in, obviously, in the departments that they are in in relation to any budget bids that come forward. But one of the things I want to look at for next year, which I've already been speaking to members about, is a more collaborative approach where all Timber members have got together 
and we go through the entire thing so members do feel they've got more of a stake in it, they do feel they've got more involvement. In terms of the Treasury officers though, I do have to pick up on the point that the Treasury officers when talking to members of Timwood aren't there with an agenda, they are actually there to offer advice. If for instance a member goes to see a Treasury officer about something in particular, that won't be passed to me as Minister. Um, it will be confidential between the Treasury officer and the member as to what they discussed and what issues they are actually experiencing. Joni Farragher, has that enough reassurance for you? I mean, I, I'm, I'm happy to pick up on the point that the Minister made there, that there is going to be budget reform in the future, and that will include a more collaborative approach. And that, I think, is, is you know what I'd like to focus on, really, because today we've been asked to vote on this budget, and that's not had a collaborative approach. But in future, if we are looking for budget reform, I am fully behind that. Obviously, it remains to be seen what... Um, what that final reform will be, um, and I will be watching that, but, yeah. Sorry, I, I just should also add, which I'd forgotten, um, it's not just about three members of Treasury making the decision, or four members of Treasury. Council of Ministers is involved, obviously, as well, in the final budget process, where there is further members, and, like I say, there is the members' involvement within their own departments as well. Tim Glover? I'm, I'm encouraged by the fact that uh, we are talking about a, a reform of the budget process, and also... Hand in hand with that, we're also looking at the benefit system and simplifying that as per the recommendations of the Poverty Committee. So those are encouraging things. There are good points in the, in the budget. I share the concerns about pensioners and the vulnerable in society, and I think Treasury need to be uh, on guard to be able to step in because we've got inflation and a number of other factors that uh, uh, could bypass what we've uh, seen presented today. Uh, but the thing that pleased me was the carers, uh, carers allowance going up by 15%, which uh, puts our uh, carers at £140.35 per week. And if you compare that to the UK, uh, it's £69.70. So I think that's a very positive thing. And I think the more the Isle of Man, uh, in terms of benefits, is ahead of the UK, the more competitive we are in terms of attracting people here. Just, just a couple of points, uh, Treasury Minister, uh, the budget process, the uh, time for review. You speak a system where departments have more freedom to allocate resource within their approved financial envelope. Don't they have that freedom at the moment? Don't so, they decide what gets spent where? So at the moment, the budget is very much defined around, um, around, around what the individual budget lines are within the department. We want to give more freedom to the departments by actually setting a financial envelope and saying this is the envelope you have That's to work cash. with and, this, and, and the departments to go and prioritise. So priority-based budgeting, basically, for the departments to say this is what we believe is the priority and be able to move the funds around internally within the department as they see fit. Are you, are you, when are you looking to do this? So this is the part of the review that will be ongoing in the next 12 months, uh, hopefully in time for the budget process um, for next year. And just one other point, as far as the investment managers are concerned, we've come to that five-year period, haven't we, where they get reviewed. And we know, I think, that uh, Lansons are leaving us because we've had this uh, effusive farewell note from Tony Lanson, basically saying it, the last 17 years were wonderful, but goodbye, everybody, and thanking everybody. This process is we, we look at everything and basically say they're not making us enough money? Is that what the bottom line is? Well, I've, I've got to be careful what I say about investment management because there is a live tender at the moment. Um, but quite rightly, we look at what the returns are on the funds that we have invested and we look to see where we can get best value for those funds. Because investors have done quite well in the last, surprisingly, in the last years, particularly, haven't they? Well, we, what we need to do is when it comes to investment, that you have to look at your risk balance as well as to what you're invested in, what risk you're taking to get the, to get the returns that you are doing. And that all forms part of the process. But like I say, I've got to be very careful because there is a live tender process. We're joined by the uh, Chief Minister. Um, thank you, Mr Cannon, for joining us. Interestingly, now it's usually a departmental member who seconds the budget, as far as I can think. No, it's usually the My Chief, chief, usually the chief Minister. Because you sprang to your feet and said yes, uh, etc. How much of this budget is yours? Well, we've, we've all had a, a significant input, as the Treasury Minister has just said. I mean, it's, it's ultimately, obviously, the Treasury Minister's job to bring, to bring it all together and to make the final um, decisions, but uh, it has to go through a Council of Ministers' approval, so there has been a joint collaborative effort in uh, setting out the uh, and approving the direction that the Treasury Minister has set for the government uh, with this first budget. Yeah, but did you nudge him and say, look, this is the direction we'd like to go in? I didn't have to nudge him, no. I, uh, the Treasury Minister shares many of my uh, views and, and values and uh, 
uh, I think uh, he's produced a, a very good, solid, um, stable budget in very difficult circumstances. And, and as, he's, as he's already alluded to, there's a lot of work to do in the next 12 months to uh, enhance that, build that out, um, and really build on some of the key policy areas that uh, we've set out in the island plan. And I was really pleased to see the way the Treasury Minister had set about you know, identifying and correlating you know, across government where the critical areas of spend would be and how they tied in with the uh, island plan and that I think came through in his speech. Do you think that the general public sees that where the money is being directed is critical in their view? Well absolutely I mean everybody's facing significant challenges at the moment we're coming you know, th through through a very difficult transitional phase in, in so many um, respects particularly obviously post uh, Covid as we get out of um, the, the sort of immediate impacts of, of the COVID pandemic and into the, the effectively what you might term the recovery phase. We've, we've definitely got to build on that. Um, that is uh, further um, complicated in terms of the Treasury's position by the other spending commitments that the government has made vis-a-vis -vis the climate change programme. And great to see £25 million allocated there and the, the, the climate change fund up and, up and running. We've got significant issues to address when it comes to housing. Again, Treasury Minister's uh, made a start there by committing to funding the, the Housing and Communities Board. Um, but of course, critically for people, it, it is about the pound in their pocket, which matters significantly. Uh, and again, I mean, I think the Treasury Minister has, has, has managed in very difficult conditions in terms of you know, the, the post-COVID impact, £300 million, the cost of government, £150 million of direct support out into the community. But still, you know, we managed to get some rises into personal allowances, some excellent, I think, initiatives when it comes to some of the supporting benefits, child benefit, uh, and others at, at 5%. Uh, the carers allowance has just been made at, uh, highlighted at 15%. But be under no illusions, um, this is going to be a very tough 12 months if, if inflation stays at, at the current level and energy prices continue to persist. This is going to make life very difficult both for the, for the budgetary challenge, for government. It's going to make life difficult for households in, in so many different respects. We are going to have to act. We've already seen the Treasury Minister do um, half a, extend half a million pounds of, of, of uh, aid out to those most vulnerable when it comes to gas um, pricing in terms of the winter bonus and we are going to obviously examine carefully where our energy pricing is going to be as we um, move forward so and and sorry just just to build on that there's obviously a lot of onus then on on ministers and their departments and the members of those departments to make sure that departmental spending um, is on track and does in some way countenance and and look forward um, and balance out the potential impacts of a very high inflation figure I must say, uh, Treasury Minister, there almost seem to be a veiled threat to departments during your, your speech to say that next year it's going to be pretty tough and you really need to, to rein it in. It, it was no threat. It wasn't a carrot and stick approach. Um, it was just a very clear message that we have to recognise there are challenges coming up on us. There's challenges coming up on all of, the, all of the countries around the world and we need to be well aware of that. Departments need to be ensure that they get value for money out of the budgets that they have and they have to be aware that they, we are not insulated from those challenges. So it was an absolutely important marker to put down. Chief Minister, you referred in, in the build-up to your election as Chief Minister as the crisis in housing. Um, you've put a million, well it's two million, but I think it's a million one year, one million next year. Is that enough? It's two million the first year, is it? And you've also put forward various members uh, of the administration to help. I think Dr. Allison's looking at brownfield sites, is he? Mr. Hooper's in there as well, Mr. Crookle, um, and obviously Mr. Thomas. Um, but, but is enough money being put at it? Is there an answer or is this just, uh, as we've heard the phrase, um, paralysis through analysis going on? Well, no, I mean, you know, I think there's, there's, a, there's, a, there's, a, there's a huge amount of work to be done in, in this area. Um, before you start spending money, you need to have a plan, an action plan, and we all need to buy in, into that plan. And that plan clearly needs to be deliverable within the frameworks that, that we're operating, and that includes a financial The developers framework. are so, the crux so, of the problem, aren't they? Well, They're... I think, well, I, I haven't had a chance to speak yet, but uh, I intend to do so this afternoon. And I think one of the points I'll be making in terms of all these critical challenges facing the government, if the government tries to solve it all itself and tries to take on the full burden itself, then we are going to quickly exceed our capabilities, our financial capabilities and possibly our operational capabilities. The trick is that we have to find ways of enabling 
others, the private sector and individuals, to set about uh, helping us meet the levels of re requirements when it comes to housing, for example. We need to tie that into uh, the other areas that are working um, across government, for example, brownfield sites. And we're going to bring those together to, I hope, um, enable uh, go, uh, the private sector and government to successfully rise up to the challenge of meeting things like our housing commitments. And you know, as that develops over, over, over the next uh, six, six, eight to ten months, when people are talking about financial commitments, then I hope it will become clearer what uh, exactly those financial commitments are. And we need to then assess how government and what government needs to allocate in order for us to meet the outcomes we've uh, hi highlighted in our island plan. There seems to be a lot, of, a lot of positive vibes in, in what you're saying there, Chief Minister. But in our first hour, we were talking to Sam, who's a young 18-year-old here, who was talking about what is there to keep young people in the Isle of Man. Housing was naturally an issue that, that came up because of that or the inability to get housing. Um, Sam, I mean, what are your thoughts? Were you reassured by what you're hearing? Um, I mean, it's, I guess... It, it's undeniable it's the right direction i'm not saying that it's going the uh the wrong way but it also does feel like uh it feels lethargic it feels like an understated reaction to a very major problem uh you know for someone like me you could ask anyone my age and i say 90 percent of the time the answer you will get is yeah i'm not gonna stay on the island oh i'm, I'm gonna go abroad why would i come back from uni um so i, I hear the points being made there completely uh, but, but personally, I just don't think it, it doesn't seem to address the problem to the extent it needs to be. Yeah, and, and I agree that a lot more meat needs to be put around um, the, you know, the, 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 the policy detail in terms of what action's actually been taken. And action is, is the critical word uh, in this respect, I'm not pretending it's easy. You know, it's uh, when you get to these sort of crisis points, which have to some extent, you know, partly been driven by the, by the market and, and what's happened with the pandemic, but also the uh, government has to take some responsibility as well. And I you know, hold my hands up and say that the, the housing policy is just not being given enough attention, has not been developed enough, uh, and we ne now need to take that forward. And that includes uh, making sure that we've got the stock available for first-time buyers, but also that we're giving them the right uh, supporting frameworks. I would uh, also you know, say, say we're not alone in this. I mean, I think when uh, I did the island plan speech, I talked that actually very much large parts of, of, of the British Isles were also suffering from exactly the same uh, issues when it, when it comes to housing stock. But nevertheless, that's not excusing us taking action. Sam, thank you for emphasising that. And I'm, you know, I'm pretty confident that by uh, you know, June, June, when we uh, come with our economic strategy, we'll have taken much uh, more direct action to help you and others uh, or at least indicate to you and others that there's some release will come in the near future. Tim Glover. Yeah, I was just going to say the, the strongest part of the Ireland plan, and I was critical of aspects of the Ireland plan, but by far the strongest and most structured was, I'm glad to say, the, uh, the housing board that's being uh, developed here. So I think there is encouragement there. The fact we've got the two million funding in there now. Uh, was the it was by far the strongest part I felt of the island plan. Well, can I just mention is Mr. Thomas part of the government or is he outside it? He's very aggressive when he's speaking. You just think, hang about, is he speaking from the outside in or is he speaking from the out, uh, inside out? Well, uh, you know, Chris uh, has been given the opportunity to help play a fundamental key role in driving forward on on our government commitments. Um, at the time, you know, after the post post election, I did discuss with him having a full ministerial job, which he he declined. Uh, however, I'm delighted that he he was willing to take on this post. We've put it up, up under uh, as a chief minister's committee. We've strengthened that committee now with two other uh, ministers. And yes, that that committee fundamentally is still responsible to to the council of ministers. And you now I'm sure that that Chris will play the right role when it comes to working cohesively and collegiately with the uh, with the Council of Ministers and his Tim Wald colleagues. Speaker of the House of Keys, Jim Watson's with us with raised eyebrows. Um, Jim, your thoughts? Well, I, I, I On have the to budget say... rather than Mr Thomas, oh, I should say. Oh, OK. All right. Now, that's a whole different conversation. Um, <laughs> well, I mean, it, it was a very sort of steady as she goes uh, uh, budget, um, th th something that the Ireland Plan has sort of come along afterwards, so it is very... Um, uh, well, I was going to say it was... A, 
a budget of boredom, but that would be harsh on the on the Treasury Minister. But then again, we had Mr. Costa to liven it all up, didn't we? So, I mean, there was um, there was certainly lots to, to see in here this morning. But I think this is one of those where areas where an awful lot of the policies and plans have been formulated um, since the, the budget has realistically had to be put to bed in terms of the spending limits. So this is a wait and see really for, for next year. Could I just ask, is there any way, um, Treasury Minister, of doing away with that frantic end of year spending? Now, I know some people say this doesn't happen and you're looking at me with that wry expression. But there does seem to be that perception that at the end of the year, whatever money you've got left over, you've just got to get rid of it quickly so you get enough the next year. That certainly probably existed about 15, 20 years ago. And, uh, but, but actually, with most departments now, and particularly with the budget pressures that departments have had over the um, last certainly five to ten years, actually what you see in those final few months isn't departments trying to get rid of the money. It's actually trying to rein back the expenditures to make sure they actually come within budget. Um, one of the things that departments has always been accused of this is DOI. Um, and actually, when I was a grumpy backbencher, I actually asked the question of DOI. Um, saying, well, there's always seems to be when you hit sort of March, fe fe February, March, much more going on. Is this you ditch in the budget? And I must be honest, they embarrassed me because they actually came up with something I hadn't actually thought of, which is, of course, during the winter months, when you are likely to have bad weather, December, January into the start of February, you're less likely to undertake repair work. So what actually happens in March is they're catching up on the work that couldn't be done in the previous few months. So um, sort of transfer but, window. But, but, but the old this. mad March spending, um, which did used to be seen, isn't seen as much now. And there is also mechanisms whereby if departments are underspent for whatever reason and they have um, a very valid reason as to why they need to retain those funds, then that can be discussions with Treasury around that. Uh, DOI member Tim uh, uh, Tim yes, Glover. Yeah, <laughs> he's given you he's given you your excuse. But um, with regards to DOI, actually, it doesn't look like they've done too badly out of the budget. A lot of bids approved. Um, let's talk about things like the prom horse trams, which are mentioned in the pink book, but no no uh, cost associated with that. There's that, and I think the minister's explained he wants uh, a little break to allow businesses to, to recover. Uh, the other thing that was very close to, to, to me and my constituency that isn't in the pink book, uh, but we've got the design fees and everything else, and I highlighted it in my speech, is Castle Russian High School. And that's a red line for me as a, a sudden MHK. We've got the, uh, the design uh, and uh, architectural fees there ready and within the budget. But it's pretty much looks like, what, 2025 before we're going to see anything being built on the site. We've got fantastic playing fields, but we're not seeing a school uh, rising uh, uh, and being built there. And that is a big concern in the South, so it's a big matter. Can I just raise the subject about the DOI uh, and this tram way? I hate to say the tram, etc. But the fact that the money was actually allocated by Tim Wald, sorry, just before you go, Treasury Minister, and basically, the minister got up and said it was used for something else. Doesn't that make Tim Will look a bit weak? Well actually, well, actually, we do have to be a bit careful because I've seen a lot of stuff on social media saying that the department has overruled the will of Tim Ward. I was one of those, by the way, who voted for the full length of the track. And my personal position is I still believe it should run the, uh, the full length. Um, but the, the previous minister did actually come back to Tim Ward um, and actually say that they were going to pause the track and then it would come back at a later date. So there were two occasions where it actually did come back well, to Tim Ward. Tim Ward City, it wasn't in the middle of the night. No, no, it was during Tim Ward City. And let's just different. say, John, there's a difference between telling Tim Ward that that's what's going to happen and asking Tim Ward if it's OK for that to happen. There's two different things. Well, there, explain there. it. Explain it. Yeah, to the well, member of the public, thinking, doesn't that mean that the money's going to be spent on that, that object? Exactly, and I think that would be Tynwald's expectation. So if, just because the minister's come along to Tynwald and said we're going to spend it somewhere differently, it doesn't mean it's OK. Um, Tynwald would still expect that that money was going to be spent the way that Tynwald voted for it. Um, and just coming back and telling Tynwald how it's going to be is not the same as coming back and asking for a change in the plan. And I don't disagree with that because, like I say, I'm one of the members who actually voted for it to go the full length of the prom, and that's still my personal position. Is it, is it going to go um, the full length of the prom? But, well, I, I think what the minister said at the moment is with all the disruption that they've had down there, and I, when I was a local councillor, I represented that area, so I still know a lot of the businesses down there who are, to be honest, are just sick of everything that's been going on down there for now, that they will come, they will take a look at it and they'll come back at a later date. But my personal position is it should still run the full length But you're of the talking prom. about a tourism strategy. 
And uh, Mr Nutter of the, um, the, the society basically said, we now have a gap in that offering. Basically, you go off the uh, MER onto the horse tram, then you've got to get off and catch a bus or something or walk until you get to the steam train. It really makes it look, you know, not, not very joined up. Well, well, like I say, my personal position, which is what I can quote, is that it should be the full length and I think it, it should be done sooner rather than later. So nodding heads going on behind That's you. That's my position. I think it should be the full length as well, I suppose. What, that, immediately I, or do we wait? I think give, give it a year's break at least to, to get the businesses to recover. They've had a torrid time over the last several years. So my view is it should go the whole length. Jim Watson? A little bit of time for the department to go on the training course about how to lay rails without having to dig them up or add <laughs> uh, cushions or whatever else is needed doing in order to rectify the work that was done the first time, I suppose, before they start putting it down again. Sorry, Treasury Minister, you were on your way, I think. Were you? Oh, you we were yes. staying. Yes. That's all right. You looked as if you were moving. <laughs> Thank you very much for joining Thank us. Thank you very much. Um, Phil Gorn is with us now, and this is a unique position for you to be in, Phil, looking at it from the outside. Um, we're still joined by Jim Watson and Rob Collister. Your views on this budget overall, what would you say? Um, it seemed so familiar to the ones that I've heard so many times in the past. Um, I mean, the, the, the thing that's quite uh, stark uh, about this budget is, you know, we've lost £300 million uh, in, in relation to the whole COVID situation. We've got a £30 million gap uh, in the current uh, level of funding. Uh, there were quite a lot of spending commitments, probably not sufficient by way of spending commitments to cover the uh, the 5%, 6% uh, inflation uh, levels at the moment. Um, but no, no real ind indication as to how any of this is going to be funded, uh, which uh, was surprising. Um, uh, but I suppose it's the way with uh, Treasury ministers that they like to sort of skirt around and... and develop smoke screens. Can I, can I just ask Mr Watson, Mr Callister, um, the basically no more support for businesses, that's it, etc. What, what's your view on that? We heard obviously members of the business community saying it's a little early for that. I think from a tourist point of view, from a hospitality point of view, I think we've got, it's got to be a watch and brief because we don't know how many visitors we're going to attract. We've still got to bring airlines online. Obviously we've got um, a lot of things planned for 2023, a new ferry, a new ferry terminal, hopefully. Um, hopefully by then we will have, we'll have recovered the position with regard to tourism. We've got a new tourism strategy for 2032. 20, 500,000 tourists. I mean, we, our peak uh, in the 1913, I think, was about six. Six hundred thousand, just before, yeah. just just well, after the just after the war. How will we manage it? And as someone I heard say this morning, how do we put them up? How do we put well, a roof over there? If you wait a couple of months, I'll, if you wait a couple of months, there will be a timber strategy going before the court. But it's it's our ambition to actually to really lift the island's tourism sector, to improve the quality of our accommodation, to bring in new types of accommodation but also to actually improve that experience. We heard a committee also hearing from the DOI saying that since 2010, um, the money spent on highways and paths and etc. has gone from 12 million to one and a half million. Well, no wonder the paths look ragged and awful. Agreed. Do you know something? When I was out canvassing during the House of Keys general election, I was surprised how good an area looked if it had been recently tarmacked. It actually brought up the whole area. Absolutely agree. And I've got questions this afternoon asking the DOI minister around what the charter will be, how um, public will be able to engage in that, how we can start to improve the overall feel and look of the Isle of Man. And that does include our roads, our pavements, etc. Do you go rambling down the south, Mr Speaker? Well, as you know, rambling is one of my fortes, John. So, uh, but, <laughs> but, but yeah, it, it is something that's always been seen as a bit of a nice to have rather than an essential service. Um, and that's been a victim of, of budgets as well. When you talked about uh, cuts to, to budgets, what I inferred from that was not that this is the time for all businesses to stand upon their own two feet and that's the end of it. What I read is that COVID, the, the COVID response is coming to an end, the end to blanket support rather than uh, targeted support where it's needed and when it's needed and how it's needed because I think the day we shut the door to that is the day we're doing a bad job as a government. With COVID so many people got out and did a bit of walking surely then I should have seen what was wonderful out there and, and still be walking out there but a lot of them are saying it's all overgrown we don't want to go out there anymore. Uh, absolutely and you know 
speaking of you know, someone who's been involved with Bushland Heritage Trust, sort of mapping the, the paths and making sure that people can learn the history along the way, um, it's a real disappointment to see that it's sort of falling by the wayside like this. Um, so, yes, there is more that needs to be done, especially we've got, it's got to be part of that linking into that, that tourism and offering. Um, but we also have to be realistic. It doesn't make any money um, it, for just on its own. So, it, it, But it is a really important part of our infrastructure, every bit as important as the, the, the pavements alongside the roads. But there again, I'll add on that if I can, that a healthy nation, it does actually actually save funds so there is different ways and I, I know from COVID myself the amount of people that I got to meet and you know from social distancing point of view but you got to see what in areas that you never normally see people there was a lot of people on this island got out and walked around our island and I hope that continues as we come out of um, COVID-19 and we start get back to normal lives that people continue that that uh, thing about sharing time with their families just getting out and exploring our island. Um, really interesting, I think, that when we consider the general election wasn't all that long ago and some of the headline uh, things that were mentioned during that, so housing naturally being one of them, mental health. Where's the mention, um, Phil Gorn, of, of things like that in this budget? Well, the housing situation is uh, it's really quite remarkable. I, I, I have to say I'm quite shocked at the... I mean, there's two million mentioned, uh, and as I understand it, it's a million this year and a million next well, year. Well, we're told, in fact, it's two million in one year, so... Well, right, it's just... Well, I, I, certainly the, the chair of the housing board understood there was he a million this year. Me as oh, right. well. that's where yeah. I from, but oh well it's two so, million in one year. So that is told. that that's interesting, but it's still two million to address um mm. what what was seen at election time as the the most significant uh, issue. All the members that uh, everyone who was standing place, that's only really um, to put the, the foundation in the policies. Absolutely right what the gentleman in the audience said earlier. We are currently losing one in every two students. We've got to identify that. We've got to work out what is the core reason behind that. Is it housing? Is it skills? Is it opportunities? Because we've got enough employment opportunities. But when I was talking to someone just the other day, they, they're unemployed. They can't get a job on the island. And when I spoke to them, they reckon it's because employers are being over picky. And then maybe times, people need to take, Rob, maybe employers need to take a chance Rob, on people. How many times do people have to say that we can't afford houses? before government's actually going to take well, it Well, I think it's a case of have, introducing that, a suite of options, maybe a government bond, maybe coming in with assistance. But we've got to make sure whatever investment government does, it learns the lessons from previous. Don't just hand over cash, which is then lost. We give funding, which we can then help the next generation. And that is where government went wrong in previous administrations. And I know you were part of it, Phil. But what, what, what we've seen, which is really interesting technique as opposed to what we've seen in the past. Normally when things are a, are a crisis, when they're a big problem, they get sucked into the centre and sorted out there. Um, and that was exactly what happened with health, uh, the Department of Health and Social Care. Um, we're starting to see signs that that's what's potentially happening in terms of the, re the review of the Department of Infrastructure. Um, Beeman's, I think, was commissioned by the Cabinet Office. But for this crisis, we're not bringing it into the centre. We're pushing it to a body that's even outside of the Council of Ministers. So, it, <clears throat> And from what I'm gathering, it's something with not an awful lot of staff at its disposal either. I mean, I, I've heard um, different things. I think there's eight in the Climate Change Transformation Group. And so far, I'm only aware of one person who's actually involved in the Housing and Communities Board from a staff perspective. So, you know, it, it, it's an interesting way of structuring a response is, to a uh, crisis. Tinwald is a, a ten, effectively, you're a tenth of the way through your legislative time, your, your policy development time um, as, as a parliament. Um, and there doesn't seem to be any significant action as yet right. in relation to Can I just come housing? in on that? I think if you look at climate change, I think it's, it's, an, it's a marathon. I think when we look at housing, it's a sprint. We've got to get those policies. As I said in my speech this morning, I don't want Mr Thomas to sit on this for 18 months. I need those policies. I want to see what they're actually, the direction they're talking about. We do have um, a homelessness problem on the island. We need to identify these. We need to understand why people are going to have to spend um, time at Grey when the system lets them down. It's those cliff edges. And it can happen to anybody. And that's the one thing that always rings around in my head is the fact everybody's only a few months away of it actually having happening to them. And that's why it's so important. And we've got a, a question here from the audience that says, great that there's investment in policies to tackle the housing crisis. However, unless Manx residents can afford to even get on the housing ladder, will this realistically tackle the squeeze on both lower income groups and those middle group earners as well? That's squeeze middle. Yeah, and that, and that, that, that's why there are... Uh, a number of things that are needed here. Firstly, we do need to continue to build houses on the Isle of Man. I think anyone who doesn't believe that is, is living in a completely different world. Um, we've, we've got a great economy, a growing economy, and there needs to be the houses to build them. 
The other thing that I think is going to be significant in this is we see going to see later on in the order paper um, quite a significant increase in the minimum wage. And I think that's going to make housing affordability far better for a, a, a cross-section of society. And also um, the younger person's uh, minimum wage, which is still differentiated, which I don't think it should be, and the Poverty Committee made comment on this, um, something that needs to be on a glide path to make sure that the living wage is not just what uh, it doesn't just sit in this sort of report that's produced annually by the Cabinet Office and statistics for what people need to live on. It's actually what people are getting in their pocket at the end of the week. Very quickly, though, the pressure on businesses to meet that level of wage is going to be huge, isn't it? It absolutely is. And some businesses will struggle more than others. Um, it's important then that we've got the, the visitor economy to come in and help support those, those numbers. Um, and also we've got the Department for Enterprise there to help support our, our, <clears throat> in the business grant and support side as well. Um, but ultimately, we can't really justify as a society paying people less than they are worth and less than it costs to live on this island. I should just say it's gone up £1.25 to £9.50 now, isn't it? And that's what the business community is basically saying. It's, it, it should be brought in gradually and not just wham in April. But then we don't gradually bring in inflation, do we? So I think the pressure that people are under, they, they want to see some action. I think you two are having a great debate down there amongst yourselves. Uh, and it's great to be able to add to it every now and then. But you're yeah, abs absolutely right. That's exactly uh, the, the story. Yes, businesses are going to struggle, but so are the people who are um, actually working for those businesses, trying to make ends meet um, when the bills arrive. Uh, Phil Gorn, final 20 seconds or so to you. Again, looking at the budget overall, um, the average person on the street, they're going to think this is a positive one? I don't think people are really going to see very much difference, to be honest, to their, their lives. Um, it's it's a, a good stand, standstill budget with lots promised for the future. Phil Gorn, thank you very much. And thank you to all the team who've uh, helped us with our Manx Radio coverage brought to you by Crow Isle of Man. As we say, if you want to have a look at all the details of the budget, we have got the Manx Radio mini site. Uh, there is a link on the Manx Radio homepage. Uh, thank you very much to our audience who've been absolutely brilliant. I'd get them to give them a round of applause, but they were a bit lacklustre earlier. Can we, can we do that now? Thank you very much to the Manx Radio team who've made this happen. The engineers, Ben Hartley, Alex Brindley and Christy D back at the station. Um, we will be having more analysts uh, of the budget, if that's a word, analysis. in update. <laughs> that's the one. It's going so well. It's probably time now to say goodbye. Thank you so much.